We're now moving on to our fourth paper. Anna Lohmann had the distinguished um, uh, uh, experience of being the first of the youngest um, German MP elected at 18 for the Green Party, has now discovered, however, the joys of scholarship as well as um, practical politics, and has also been doing work on uh, three interesting countries, Sudan, Libya, and Jordan. So, Anna, over to you. Well, <clears throat> hello. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction, uh, introduction, and also thank you for having me here. Um, in my dissertation, I explore a research question that I know a lot of you think is uh, rather impossible uh, to study, uh, namely the contribution of international electoral assistance to the credibility of elections. Um, today, I'm trying to convince you that actually with an innovative research design, uh, it is actually possible to at least shed some light uh, on this issue. <clears throat> I'm also, I have to make the same disclaimer uh, as the previous speaker, this is really preliminary what I'm presenting here, it's, it's work in progress in my, in my PhD project. Um, so far I've conducted an extensive literature review and uh, three case studies uh, with field research uh, in, in Libya, in Jordan and in Sudan. And the idea today is to develop uh, some, uh, some uh, ideas about mechanisms linking electoral assistance uh, towards um, uh, election credibility. Let me first start maybe with the, with the research problem uh, that you're all very familiar with. Um, first of all, I think the electoral cycle um, is mainly discussed, as we've heard many times uh, during this workshop, as a temporal widening of uh, electoral integrity. But actually, I think it also has a conceptual dimension that should be um, should be uh, further em emphasized. Um, because if you look at what is commonly discussed as electoral cycle, you actually you find the election management as an ingredient. You find um, the legal framework that has uh, uh, gotten attention. Then you increasingly find the role of, of non-state actors, such as uh, political parties, uh, voters, uh, media. Um, and increasingly also the role of other state act actors other than the electoral management body, the police forces, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the legal system. Um, and I think all these four have to be uh, taken into consideration. And this is also what electoral uh, assistance providers do these days. They provide electoral management assistance. They provide legal advice, as I know also many of you are into that um, uh, affair. Uh, they provide capacity development training for political parties, for media, but also capacity development for, um, for lawyers, for, for police and other security actors. So we really have this like four-pronged strategy now when we talk about electoral assistance. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I argue that um, the likely effects of electoral assistance vary in different political concepts. And here, I mainly build uh, on the work of Andreas Schettler and others on elections in authoritarian contexts, because as we know, in authoritarian contexts, uh, state actors are more than likely to actually interfere and manipulate um, the electoral process. And I'm, I'm really wondering whether uh, electoral assistance providers with their capacity development can actually do anything about that. Um, then uh, we also know that in, uh, in authoritarian contexts, um, the quality of the legal framework is not likely to be very high. Um, so I'm actually, when in, in, the, in, in, in my research, I'm trying to, to separate this universe of uh, cases into transitional elections, where you didn't have an that don't have an incumbent uh, regime as, as on election day and uh, authoritarian elections. So the research question is now how to cause the links between electoral systems and election credibility actually vary in different political contexts. Um, yeah, and also maybe um, uh, just to, to highlight the, the implications of this, this conceptual separation. Um, we know that in authoritarian elections, um, regimes try actually to benefit from the legitimacy game, uh, gain of uh, holding elections without uh, risking uh, to lose these elections. Um, so they have an interest actually in relatively clean procedures on election day. And I was just fascinated by, by Nicholas' uh, presentation because that actually supports this argument. If citizens really perceive or base their judgments of electoral integrity mainly on what they see on election day or how they perceive the election uh, management body, um, then um, this would imply that authoritarian regimes would actually be smart 
to accept electoral assistance uh, on improving uh, electoral uh, uh, election management, but somehow try to either distort or not accept advice on the other three important areas of electoral integrity. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm suggesting actually that they apply a strategy of cher cherry picking in, in this regard. Um, yeah, let me start now with my, my case of, of transitional elections. I, here I chose Libya uh, in, in 2012. Um, as you uh, all know, the Libyan elections were the first after the fall of, uh, of the Gaddafi regime, so the first in, in over 40 years. Hence, I think it qualifies as a, as a crucial case if it's possible to organize uh, in t uh, elections of, of, uh, with a high level of integrity in such a setting, then um, it's quite likely that this is possible uh, in a lot of other transitional elections. And here uh, I also have to, um, have to, to thank uh, Nahomi, actually, uh, uh, my discussant, for, for pointing out that I, in, in the written paper, I don't know if anyone of you have, has, has actually read it, but uh, in the written paper I have uh, uh, tried to teach you German. I spoke about integer elections, which is, uh, <clears throat> would be a, uh, in German, this works, but in English, it doesn't. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, so of course, we're talking about electoral integrity here. And um, so let's think about in the case of Libya. We had um, about 40 technical advisors um, provided through um, uh, uh, UN agency agencies that uh, try to improve uh, the election management. So how on earth would we know how they actually contributed to the credibility of elections? Here yeah, I'm trying to apply a method that is used in development studies. It's called theory-based approaches to development uh, evaluation. And you basically, you really try to build a very, a very, um, uh, a very rich uh, theory about how the program um, could have worked and what the contextual assumptions are. So you don't like just go with this linear log frame that, that you used earlier, but you really try to spell out contextual assumptions that need to be in place in, in order for this to work. And here, um, I think, for, from what I find from, from my studies in, in Libya, uh, I think uh, you, there are two main contextual assumptions that you need for electoral assistance to improve the, the quality of election management. And that is that the joint capacity of election management, with joint, I mean, of the electoral assistance providers and the national uh, EMB, has to be high and the regime has to be compliant. They have to uh, want and accept this advice. And then, um, so in Libya, we actually had a very high quality election management certified in, in uh, all observer reports. So how does this lead actually to a high uh, electoral integrity? Here again, based on what I discussed, uh, previously discussed on, on, on the, the theoretical notions, you need a legal framework that is conducive for electoral integrity and you need non-interference of state actors. This is actually what we, what we saw in Libya. So all observers actually speak of, of a high electoral integrity. Uh, the, the chief EU observer even says this was the best election he has ever seen so far. So I think this is quite, we, we can say that with, with quite high levels of confidence. So now how does this relate to election credibility? And here, because of a lack of survey research, we actually, uh, I, I'm, this is why I, 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 I made this line a bit um, more dotted. Um, we, at least in Libya, I had a focus group research um, accessible to me that was conducted through NDI. They, they did focus group research in, in 13 Libyan cities. And here the citizens said that they uh, think the elections were, uh, had, uh, were credible uh, and mainly due to their perception on election day. Again, also this similar to what, what Nicholas finds. Uh, so I'm, and plus, additionally, what came out in this focus group, which I think is a very, uh, very important aspect for transition elections, citizens expressed that they had a very, very positive attitude towards the electoral process. So basically they said that this, um, this is the reward for the revolution, this is what their brothers died for. So I think this, this probably is another factor that needs to be considered if we discuss the link between electoral integrity and the contribution um, to uh, actually the credibility of elections. Just because I'm running out of time, um, uh, the other mechanism that I saw, but with a very a very small empirical um, evidence, but I think this could be further studied. Um, there actually, there's some sort of a guardian mechanism as well that um, basically in um, just the, the presence of, of UN uh, or other electoral assistance providers uh, might actually improve the cred credibility of elections in the population because I say here, um, you are here um, 
uh, and you, um, uh, it's, it's also an international election. This, of course, only works if they have a, a relatively positive reputation. I saw this mechanism uh, also in Sudan, where actually uh, uh, one of a civil society representative told me, well, you uh, as internationals, this is your election. You help to, uh, to re-legitimize re uh, Bashir just through your mere presence, even though the observer reports in the end were very, uh, very negative and very critical. Um, so this is uh, with my second case. Um, in, in Sudan, you can read it more in detail in the paper. Um, the, I, I'm arguing that because the regime was non-compliant at the Sudanese election in 2010, even a, a very large-scale electoral assistance project did not lead to a higher level of uh, election management integrity and then also to limited electoral integrity. But nevertheless, the ruling party used this uh, to renew their legitimacy claims. And from research on regime legit legitimacy, we know that we can use change leg legitimacy claims as um, uh, as a proxy actually also to to uh, what what works for citizens and 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 how they see it so there's definitely a need for more research on this uh, maybe I just skip my my third case Jordan it's not African anyway so um, you can read that in the paper um, so just to to wrap up um, as I said it's an exploratory study so um, the findings are not not very robust I have to admit that but nevertheless I think I identified uh, two possible mechanisms that need to be further studied, this um, coach mechanism through the uh, improvement of election management support and the guardian mechanisms just through the mere presence of international actors. Uh, I also think it's necessary for further studies to make this conceptual separation between transitional and authoritarian elections uh, because they're just two different um, types. And in transitional elections, I think judging from Libya, the link between electoral assistance to election credibility is probably often very strong and also desirable. Um, I discussed that in the paper more. In authoritarian um, elections, I think there is a possibility that electoral assistance actually enhances the credibility of flawed elections because citizens and other observers might base their judgments of the electoral process mainly on how the election management was and not on the other three aspects of the uh, election integrity. Hence, we need more research, mainly focusing on how actually this branding of elections happens, also in the direction of what Nicholas has done, uh, but also looking at, at, the, the, at uh, the public discourse in these countries. Uh, and then, of course, um, the actors involved need risk mitigation strategies to avoid actually um, legitimizing a flawed electoral process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. And I really welcome um, thinking about other types of impacts of other types of electoral assistance beyond observers. I think it's a big, big agenda we need to look at.